everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Lesnick with Education Dynamics. We produce GradSchools.com and UniversitiesBroad.com. And we're thrilled to have Dr. Don Martin with us today. I'll let him kind of introduce himself and share with us about the graduate school application process. But thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to sharing this information with you. Hello, everyone. My name is Don Martin, and it is a pleasure to be with you today for this webinar on graduate school, the graduate school application process. Thank you so much for joining us. We have participants from literally just about all over the world with us today. That's very exciting, and I trust that in the next uh, 40 minutes to an hour, we're going to be able to provide some information for each of you that will be very helpful, relevant, valuable, and provide you with some hope and encouragement as you consider the possibility of getting a graduate degree. Um, as you can see here on the screen, I actually earned a master's and PhD myself. These were two of the most amazing experiences of my entire life. I enjoyed it thoroughly, and it really made a difference in my career. And um, so I am personally coming to this, not only having been a dean of admissions at some of the universities you see there on the screen, but also as a, a former graduate student myself doing two different graduate programs. As you'll also notice, I've written a book called Roadmap for Graduate Study. I'll be talking about that later in our time together. I've been a weekly columnist with US News and World Report, and I've had the privilege of working with students just on about every continent uh, in my 28 to 30 years doing this work. Now, today, what I want to cover uh, are some of the following. I'd like to share with you some thoughts I have about the do's and don'ts of the graduate application process. We want to talk about some ways to get positively noticed as an applicant, but also some things you want to avoid doing, which if you do, are going to probably very much predict that you will not get accepted to the schools you apply to. I want to talk a little bit about the interview. Many of you might be involved in doing an admissions interview during the course of your application process. I'd like to share something about essays and recommendations, talk about academics and test scores, and then finally talk about responding if you happen to find out from the admissions committee that you've been placed on a waiting list or denied admission. That is not the end of the world by any means. I want to say that right here. And we're going to talk a little bit about what you might do if you find out you've been waitlisted or denied. And then after that, we're going to spend some time answering your questions. As Kim said earlier, before we actually started the webinar, if you have questions at any point while I'm sharing this information, I hope you'll send them in. And my colleague Valerie is here with me, and she's going to let me know some of the questions that are asked throughout the presentation. And we're going to leave some time to answer those when I'm finished with my remarks. So having said that, Let's get started with some do's and don'ts of the application process. The first one I want to emphasize very much is please do read the instructions carefully for your applications, but don't rush through them. In other words, take the time you need to read what it is you're being asked to do throughout the application. Applications have similar components. Everyone's going to ask you to do an essay or two or three. You're going to be asked to submit transcripts, test scores, but there could be some certain ways they want you to do that or a specific order in which they want you to do this. Make sure you do read the instructions carefully and also do not rush. Give yourself enough time to really prepare your application because if you don't, you're going to feel rushed and you could be more easily prone to make a mistake, which could, could hurt you in the application process. Secondly, evaluate the service that you receive from the institutions that you're contacting. Obviously, that's very important. That's one of the ways for you to find out what that institution is really like. Are they responsive to you? Do they answer your questions? Do they give you a sense that they really care about you and want to help you? But at the same time, don't forget, as you're communicating with them, they're getting a chance to evaluate you as a candidate, as an applicant. So obviously, it's important that you know how you feel about these institutions. But remember, they're doing the same thing with you. And they're, at, the longer they're in contact with you, the more they know what you are like 
or what they think you are like, and that can enter into their final decision on your application. Thirdly, um, make sure that when you apply, and I think we got two of these uh, out of order here, so let me refer you on this slide to number two, which is when you make sure you apply when you are ready to do so, not sacrificing quality for speed. This kind of goes along with my earlier suggestion about not rushing, but what you want to be sure of is, let's say you have three application deadlines, one in October, one in December, and one in February. And let's say you reach the October deadline and you just aren't quite sure that everything is just how you want it in that application. My suggestion, wait till the next deadline. Most all graduate institutions admit students from all of their deadlines. They don't just admit for the first one. Some folks think that's the case, but it's really not. They're going to look for good applications from each of their deadlines. So, if you're not sure your application is absolutely ready for that first one, wait till the second deadline. And that way you're making sure that what you submit is good quality. Number four, this is very important. You need to show confidence as an applicant, but you don't want to appear conceited or overly arrogant. That is, there, there's a difference here. Being confident involves good eye contact shaking someone's hand firmly when you meet them, letting them know that you're confident that you can do graduate work, but not in a way where you think you're better than other people or you're almost being a bit too much to promote yourself. So be careful that you exhibit confidence but not conceit. Again, number five, be assertive, but be careful about being arrogant or coming across as, as overbearing. Number six, be persistent with your applications. Don't hesitate to reach out to the admissions committee from time to time, but be careful about not becoming a pest. By that I mean you should not be contacting the admissions office every week. Believe it or not, this happened to me quite often when I worked at Columbia University or the University of Chicago or Northwestern. I'd have certain applicants who were contacting me by phone or by email or almost every week and it was just too much it, it it got to be the point where they they almost appeared desperate or or you know why did they need to reach out all that all that much you can contact the admissions office and be persistent in letting them know you're interested but be careful not to do it too much and if you have questions about any of these as I said please send them in to us I'll be happy to try and answer as many as I can toward the end of the presentation finally be patient but not overly passive. What, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take for an example when you have been told you're going to get a response to your application. Let's say you applied in January and the application says for all of those who apply in January we will contact you by March 15th of a decision. And so you wait till March 15th and then you don't hear anything. And you keep waiting and you keep waiting and now you're almost in July and you still haven't heard. That's being a little too passive. If you haven't heard by a certain point in time, say a week or two after the deadline, there's nothing wrong with contacting the admissions committee again and asking if they could let you know if a decision was reached on your application. But be patient and wait until that deadline has approached when you're supposed to hear about your application and then soon after that contact them. Okay, once again these are some do's and don'ts related to the application process. Now we're going to move to another very important component of the graduate application process and these are what I call seven major ways to be positively noticed as a graduate school applicant. Now by this I don't mean how to manipulate the admissions committee to think you're wonderful. You know when somebody isn't themselves with you, when you start talking with someone in, in a conversation you, you usually can notice if somebody's not being on the level with you, if you think they're being fake. Well, admissions committee people pick up on that too. So you, you don't, this is not about not being yourself. I'm talking about some actual ways you can enhance your application. The first one here is to send a short note to the admissions committee with your application. Included in this, now by the way, do not send this via email. My suggestion, do not do that. 
send it through a regular mail as a letter. You put a stamp on it, and you send it to the director of admissions or the dean of admissions, or if you don't know their name, you can send it to the admissions committee. And in this letter, it should be one page long, that's all. Here are some things you can do. In the first paragraph, introduce yourself. You could say, my name is so-and-so, and I'm very excited. I just sent my online application to your master's program or your doctoral program. Secondly, explain why you chose that program. This is very, very important. Why? Admissions committees like to know that you did your research, that you spent time actually researching their program and finding out what they have to offer. And when you indicate some of the things that caused you to choose this program in this letter that you're sending, make sure those things apply only to that program, not to any other university. I used to be so disappointed when students would continuously send essays to me at Columbia and they would say, I chose this program because Columbia is in the top five or Columbia is in the Ivy League. That doesn't tell me anything about why you really want to study with our, with our school, why you've chosen our program. Make sure the reasons that you give show that you did your research, that you dug deeper, and you really came up with some reasons why this program looks good to you and why you want to attend. Finally, toward the end of the letter, communicate your strong interest. Let them know that you would really like to be there, that you would really like to be a part of the student body. There's nothing wrong with that. Let them know that you, you would like for the chance to be admitted. Number two on these seven major ways to be positively noticed. Make sure you use good recommenders. Oh, I can't stress this enough. This is critical. Make sure your recommenders know you well enough to write their letters and most importantly, provide examples of the things they say about you. It's not good enough for someone to just say, oh, Jane is very motivated or John is a very good communicator. Well, that's great, but if there's nothing to prove that or show how they know that or why they believe that to be true of you, you're going to hurt yourself. The best recommendations are done by individuals who know you well enough to talk about your strengths and give examples of them. So make sure you use good recommenders. Number three, you can be reasonably creative in your application. Um, one person in an essay one time wrote the letters of their name. Each letter, the first name and the last name, and then for each of those letters, they used an adjective to describe themselves. I thought that was pretty creative. I, there are things like that that you could do. Now, what you don't want to do is, again, go overboard here, like one student who sent me roses on Valentine's Day. That's a, for those of you that are international students, Maybe they do Valentine's Day in other countries, but that's a day in our country where people who love each other send roses and cards and go out for dinner together. Well, I had an applicant who sent me roses on Valentine's Day with a note that said something like, Dear Dean Martin, I am the one for you. We will always be together. I will never let you down. Now, that was just, and I still have that card, by the way. I'm not making this up. This absolutely happened. That's a little overboard. So. My point, you can be reasonably creative, just don't go too far. Number four, this probably sounds so simplistic, but it's so critical. Smile. If you come for an admissions interview or you're coming to visit the campus for a couple of days or whatever, or you're meeting some alumni or students, or even if you're on the phone, do you know they've done studies that say your voice sounds happier when you smile, even when you're on the phone? Try it sometime. It's absolutely the case. So it lightens things when you smile. Will you be nervous if you're doing an interview? Sure you will, because you want to do a good job. But just smile. It's the universal language. It just lightens things up a little bit. And it makes a positive impression about you, by the way. Number five, ask good questions. Again, this goes back to that letter I, I suggested you sent. Let the institution know that you did your homework. Do you know? Two of the worst questions I have ever been asked by a prospective graduate student are, what are your application deadlines? That is, a, that is a completely inappropriate question. They're plastered all over the website. They're on the application. They're everywhere. You should not be spending time asking an admissions person what the application deadlines are. That obviously means you didn't do any homework at all, and it does not reflect well on you. The questions you ask 
should be based on a lot of research that you've already done, and maybe you need more information about something. But do not ask questions you can answer for yourself. Number six, keep your cool no matter what. What do I mean by this? Well, admissions folks are human beings. They make mistakes. Uh, even though you submit your application online, most likely it will still be printed out at the other end, but whatever its destination, whichever institution. They're going to print that out and put it in a file folder. And it's going to go around to be reviewed by one or more individuals before a decision is made on your application. In that process, it's possible that a recommendation letter that came for you accidentally gets put in someone else's folder. And when the application is looked at, to get ready for a review, they discover that they're missing a recommendation that you did send. And you might get an email message saying, we don't have your recommendation letter. You know, I could write a book about the responses of applicants when they were told that something they didn't expect to happen with their application had occurred. And we didn't have something that they were certain they sent. One person, one time, read to me out loud on the phone their entire tracking number from FedEx or UPS or DHL as proof that they had sent this particular document. And I said to them, I didn't say I was questioning that you sent it. I'm simply trying to help you by telling you we don't have it. So if that happens, remember, this is an opportunity for you to show the admissions committee how you handle something that's a little disappointing. Maybe they, maybe they lose your entire application. I say that because that happened to me once at the University of Chicago. We lost an entire application. And the way that particular applicant responded was so impressive to me that I decided I was admitting them even before we got all their application materials again. We paid for them to send everything a second time, but I already knew I was going to admit this applicant because they were so amazingly positive when they found out it happened. Remember, if something like this happens to you, it's not going to be pleasant, but it gives you an opportunity to show who you are, what you're made of, and that you can handle something that's a little out of the ordinary. So keep your cool at all times. Finally, communicate your strong interest in the program. As I said, through that cover letter you send at the beginning or at any point in the process. Now, don't overdo this. Don't say it every time. But certainly let them know that you're interested in their program. That obviously uh, bodes well for you if, you if you do say that. All right, now we're going to switch gears here for a moment. And let me make sure that you're writing down those were the seven ways to get positively noticed. Now. Here are some things that absolutely you do not want to do. I call them the seven deadly sins for applicants. The first, dishonesty. I honestly do not believe that any graduate applicant is a bad person. I don't believe that about anyone. What I do believe is that sometimes applicants start thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to send in this application to this major university. I'm going to be up against all these other applicants, and they are much stronger than I am. So I have to do something to make my application better than it really is. So if I got a 3.25 GPA, I'll just tweak that and say I got a 3.52 GPA. So it'll look a little better, and they'll never notice that. Or I'll just fudge on my test scores a little bit. I'll just give them a, or I'll, I'll write my own recommendation letter and put all these wonderful things in and say things about myself that I never did. Folks, in this day and age, admissions committees are pretty vigilant, and they do track this type of thing. They, whether it's test scores, GPA, essays, recommendation letters, there are ways of finding out if the applicant really did this themselves or had other folks do it as they were supposed to or if they've been dishonest in some way. And if you are, it's going to end your chances. And you know, it's so sad because you don't need to do this. All of you listening to me, and I hope you'll, I, I'm not just saying this, to make you feel good. It's the truth. All of you listening to me can go to graduate school just based on who you are and what you bring to the table. You may have some extra persuading to do in some cases. You may have some extra explaining to do, but you do not ever need to yield to the temptation to be dishonest. Don't do it. Number two, as I said, too much contact. Don't be a pest. Don't be calling the admissions office every week. Hello, it's me again. I just wanted to tell you I'm still here and I'm so interested. That's not necessary. If you need to contact them with a legitimate question, absolutely. If they contact you, of course you should respond. But do not do it too much. It makes you look desperate. Number three, please follow directions. If you don't do this, the question immediately comes up, 
if this applicant cannot follow directions, how do we know they're going to, how are they going to behave as a student? They're not even here yet, and they're not doing what we've asked them to do. If they ask you to write a 500-word essay, give them a 500-word essay. Now, you can be over by a few words. That's not going to hurt you. But do not, I had an applicant to Columbia one time. We were asking for a 750-word personal statement. He sent his master's thesis, which was 100 pages long. That was his first essay question. Obviously, that showed he had either hadn't read the essay or deliberately decided to, to, to do something different than what he was asked. This does not bode well for you. You may not always understand why they're asking you to do something, but you should do it. If that's the direction, follow them. Number four, rude and arrogant behavior. We've already talked about this. There's no place for it. It will hurt you largely if you behave this way. You need to be on your best behavior, and you need to act professionally. Number five, sending the wrong or non-proof information. Oh, my word. Especially your essays. There's no excuse anymore for sending an essay that is riddled with typographical errors or grammatical errors. There are too many sources out there, and, and there are too many te technological resources available to you to help you proofread your work not to mention having someone else take a look at it and let you know if you spelled everything correctly. So if you, if you send in an, an essay that is riddled with these mistakes, you're going to be waitlisted at best, no matter what else is in the application. It's going, to, it's going to send a message to the admissions committee that you really didn't think this through very carefully or you're not spending time really working on those essays or some of the other information they're requesting. Also, this is where not rushing with your application comes into play. If you take the time you need, hopefully you'll send the right essay to the right institution. That is very critical. I used to read essays at the University of Chicago, and it would say, that's why Stanford University has always been my first choice for my graduate program. Well, obviously, they were sending us their essay for Stanford. And I would say, well, I hope you get in there, because obviously you're not interested in Chicago. So make sure you send the right information and correct information when you send in your application. Here again, asking questions you could answer for yourself. Here's another question that I'm often asked or was often asked by applicants when I was working full time as a dean of admissions. Are you ready? I already told you one of them. What are your application deadlines? Here's another one. Do you offer financial aid? Do you know how tempted I was to want to say to that applicant, no, I'm sorry, we have nothing to offer you. You have to pay for this yourself. We have no scholarship. Of course we have financial aid. Every institution has financial aid. That is a question you don't ask. Again, make sure the questions you're asking you were not able to find answers for. And finally, it, do, do not leave something out of your application or, or make excuses if you're addressing it. What do I mean by this? Let's say you took a break in your undergraduate education for two years to do something else. Explain that. Let the admissions committee know. I decided to take a break in my undergraduate experience to do the following. That's not going to hurt you as long as you address it and explain why. If you had a lower GPA as an undergraduate, do not make excuses. Don't say, oh, life was so hard for me. I've always been so under, under supported in my life. That's not going to go anywhere. But what you can do is say, during my sophomore year of college, I lost a member of my family. Or, I was involved in a car accident and I was in the hospital for two months. If something happens, we all know that sometimes in life certain things happen. And it can affect your ability to perform academically. So explain those things, just don't make excuses for them. If, if you just didn't study well in undergrad, acknowledge that. Uh, that's not, not, that's not going to kill you in the application, but you've got to be willing to own up to what happened and not make excuses. Okay, we have talked about some do's and don'ts for the application process. We've talked about seven ways to get positively noticed as an applicant. We've talked about seven deadly sins for applicants. In our remaining 10 or 15 minutes, I now want to spend some time talking about some of the specifics of the application and give you some suggestions here. And I hope you'll feel free to, again, write any of this down. Uh, I certainly hope you're doing that. Uh, and here we go with the interview couple of tips for you in doing your admissions interview. Now, in, in this day and age, it seems that fewer admissions committees are requiring every applicant to have an interview. 
In most cases, they're doing these more where they invite you into campus if they would wish for you to have an interview. But whatever, if you have the chance to do an interview, you should take it. If, if they say interviews are optional, in my opinion, when you submit your application, you should tell them, I'm asking to do an interview. And when you have it set up, if you're going to have a physical interview with someone as opposed to one on Skype or Yahoo Messenger or something like that, make sure that you arrive early. Make sure you're not late for this interview. And even if you're doing it on Skype, you should be signed up and ready to go 15 minutes ahead of time. Be prepared. Make sure you've got an idea of some of the questions you think will be asked of you and how you're going to answer those questions. Obviously, you won't know all the questions, but be prepared. And number three, keep your cool. Again, I said this uh, uh, during the application process. What do I mean in the context of your interview? Probably the hardest time for an applicant in an interview is if you're asked a question you weren't expecting or you're not sure how to answer. And what you want to do, keep your cool. Don't, don't, you, they realize that they're going to ask you some things that you weren't expecting. They, that's already a given. So what you want to do is when that question is asked, take a deep breath. And, and you could even say in a, in a couple instances, some applicants would say to me, Dean Martin, uh, may I have just a minute to think through my answer? Absolutely. That's much better than trying to blurt something out that you're not sure of. And actually, that speaks well of you. If you need a few seconds, a, a 30 seconds, a minute, to just think through what you want to say, just say, you know, that's a great question. Uh, could I have just a few seconds to prepare my response? There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Just keep your cool, be calm, and don't let that rattle you. And another very important tip is have some questions ready to ask of yours. Maybe just one or two questions that you would like to ask the interview. And one of the key questions, if this interviewer is an alumnus of the institution, if he or she went there before, or is a current student, or even is a member of the staff, whichever person you're interviewing with, one good question you could always ask them is, what do you see as some of the strongest aspects of this program and some of the weakest? No school is perfect. And if they don't have any weaknesses to share with you about their school, that tells you something about them. They're not being very honest. So a very good question, you, one you can always ask, could you tell me from your vantage point, what do you believe are some of the best aspects of this graduate program, and what are one or two areas that you're working on or that you want to improve? And finally, always send a thank you note to your interviewer. That's critical. If you can handwrite it, that's even more powerful, as opposed to an email address or or a, a type letter, just send a nice handwritten thank you note as saying, thank you for your time. I so enjoyed meeting you and, and just letting them know that you appreciate that they took the time to do the interview. Okay, let's move on to essays and recommendations. We've already talked about the first tip here. Answer the questions, stick to the word limit. Do not provide them information they didn't request unless you have enough, word limit, uh, uh, enough words to do it. If you use the word limit answering the question, stop then you, you've done what you've been asked to do. If an optional essay is offered to you, if, you, if they say, is there anything else you would like to, uh, to tell the admissions committee, or they have an optional essay question, always do it. Always take the opportunity to complete an optional essay. It just shows that you're a little more interested, that you're taking your time to, to fill out every part of that application that you can. That looks very favorable for you. Make sure you keep in touch with your recommenders before the deadline to be sure that they're not forgetting. Now, again, don't pester them, not every day, but maybe a month before the deadline, you could check in and say, I just wanted to make sure you have, do you have any questions about the recommendation letter? Are you OK with it? And maybe a week before, you could just say, just wanted to remind you I'm going to be applying next week. Thank you again for helping me. It's not like you have to say, are you doing the letter? I don't mean it that way, but you need to let them know that you are getting ready to apply just as a reminder for them to make sure they get their recommendations in on time. And finally, uh, thank your recommenders after the deadline and after you've been admitted. That's a very critical piece again. Make sure you're thanking folks for what they did to help you. And by all means, you should let your recommender, and you could probably do this with your interviewer too, let them know after you've been admitted that their efforts and their help uh, was part of what happened in, in that decision being provided to you. Okay, 
our time is fast moving along, and I want to leave time. I assume we're getting questions uh, from my colleague Valerie. I'm hearing we're getting questions, so I, I definitely want to allow time to answer them. Let's move on to academics and test scores. This is also very important. As we said earlier, if you need to explain something regarding your academic record, by all means do so. But don't make excuses. Simply make an explanation. This happened to me during undergrad. I went through this particular situation. I didn't study or apply myself as hard as I should have. Now, that brings me to point number two. If the explanation for your academic record being a little less than you want it to be is that you just didn't apply yourself, it would be my strong recommendation that you take one or two graduate level courses before you apply. Take, take one or two. You don't have to take a lot. It doesn't have to be a difficult course necessarily. But to show the admissions committee that because of the fact that you're acknowledging that you didn't apply yourself as you could have as an undergrad, you want to show them that you have the capability of doing graduate level work now. This is very impressive. Just one course, you don't even have to take two, but at least one graduate level course now. And you could say, I didn't do as well as an undergrad, but I hope you'll take a look at the transcript I'm submitting for this graduate course I just completed in which I got an A or a B. That is very powerful and very impressive to the admissions committee. Thirdly, spend time making sure you're ready to take whatever standardized tests you need. For international students, if English is not your first language or it is not the primary language of your country, obviously you may have to take the TOEFL or the IELTS or another uh, English proficiency test. Be prepared to do that. Most applicants will take the GRE or the GMAT. Some may take the LSAT, which is for law school, or the MCAT, which is for medical school. Whichever, spend some time preparing to take the test. But don't take them too often. I used to have applicants who took the test 10 times. Studies have shown after the third or fourth attempt, you're not going to make that much difference in your score. It's not going to go up or down that much. And taking it more than once, especially if you didn't do as well as you wanted, is an indication to the admissions committee that you're trying to do everything you can to submit your best application. So prepare, take these tests, but don't. I would not encourage you to take it more than three times. OK, now to a very important piece of the application process. What happens if you do not get admitted, and instead you're told that you've been placed on a waiting list, or perhaps worse, that you've been denied? Now, this is never easy to hear. It's not what you were hoping to find out. But it's not the end of the world. Don't take it personally. This is not against you as a person. It's not, a, it's not an estimate of your ability to do graduate work. It simply could mean that there were 1,000 applications for 200 openings in the incoming class. So that means they have to say no to several people. And in many cases, they have to say no to applicants who are quite strong. Excuse me just a moment. I'm going to take a drink of water. I'm not going anywhere. OK, that's better. <clears throat> so do not take it personally if they do this. But what you can do is request some feedback. Uh, perhaps they'll give you some reasons why you were waitlisted or denied. And if you're waitlisted and they want you to do something more in the application, respond as quickly as you can. Uh, Please don't argue with the feedback, especially if you've requested feedback. This used to amaze me. Applicants would call me and ask us to tell them why they got denied. And when we did, they would argue with us. And they would say, well, that's not true. Or how could you say that? I, no, 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 no. When, if you ask for the feedback, all you do is listen and respond to that feedback. You don't question it. You don't argue with it. You say thank you, and then you respond. That will help your situation. And here's a little tip that may come as a surprise, but it's the absolute truth. If you're waitlisted, that doesn't mean you're this close to being denied. It usually means they want to admit you, but they need more information or they need something else. So do not assume if you're waitlisted that you're automatically going to be denied. That's absolutely not true. If you are denied, and this was the institution that you really wanted to attend, consider reapplying. Did you know that your chances of admission increase the second time you apply? They don't decrease. Many people think, oh gosh, if I've been admitted one time and I apply again, they're going to just turn me down. Absolutely not. It's the opposite. If an institution 
receives a second application from you with information about how you've tried to improve that second application, what you've been doing in the, ne in the year since you first applied. That's a very positive thing for you, not a negative. So don't despair if you're waitlisted or denied. There are things you can do. It is not the end of the world by any means. Okay, we're nearing the conclusion of my comments this afternoon or this evening or this morning, wherever you may be. Um, I wanted to share just a little bit about my book, as I mentioned at the beginning of our, of our time together. I did write a book called Roadmap for Graduate Study, and it's, uh, you can find it here on my website, www.gradschoolroadmap.com. If those of you who are international students that are listening today would purchase the book on the website and you show me proof of that, I will send to you my free international student supplement, which was produced in 2009. It's a companion piece to the book for international students. So if you're interested in the paperback version or the ebook version, please feel free to go to my website. You can also check out some other services that I offer there. Okay, our time is fast going away. Now it is your turn. The questions have been coming in, and um, I am ready to answer any, I'll try to answer as many as I can in our remaining time together. So uh, Valerie, I'm going to ask you to uh, see if I can have some questions. Oh my word, we got quite a few. This is great. Okay, so let me, um, let me just position this here. All right, I'm going to read the question and then I'll do my best to answer it for you. Okay, here we go. First question. I know that in the conventional job market, in the, I guess we're talking about the employment realm here, it is important to network. Who you know matters a lot. Does the same apply in the academic world? Are all applicants considered equally? What's the role of networking and meeting people in the graduate school application process? That's an excellent question. And my response would be, based on my years uh, working with graduate school students, with faculty members, with admissions committee members, networking is, is important. I would say it's less important at the master's level. Um, I, I think it's more important at the doctoral level because as a doctoral student, you will most likely be working with a specific faculty member who will serve as your advisor throughout your entire time there. And getting to know faculty members so that they can be part of recommending you as a doctoral applicant is important because it is faculty who usually make the decisions on PhD applicants, unlike master's applicants where decisions are usually made by the admissions committee. So networking at the doctoral level is definitely important. Uh, there was another question in there, are all applicants considered equally? Yes, in 99% of the cases, applicants are considered equally. There's, there's a process in place for evaluating applicants, and it tends to be followed by the admissions committee for every person that they evaluate. That was a very good question. Let's go to the next one. Is the converse of any of these character traits, uh, do's and don'ts, also true? In other words, is it possible to be overly modest? Yes, I think it is possible to be too modest and not talk enough about what you believe are your qualities and the fact that you believe you're ready to do graduate study and why. Yeah, I think you need to be able to articulate what you really think it is about you that will cause you to be successful in graduate school. In fact, some of the uh, personal statements or essays that you're going to complete will include a section where you're going to be asked to do just that. And in your interview, I as, I'm assuming one of the questions you'll be asked by your interviewer is, what, it, what is it about you that you think would cause this school to want you to be a member of their student body? So absolutely yes. Don't be too modest uh, and, and don't be unwilling to talk about what you believe to be your honest skills. Okay, uh, third question. If we don't feel university professors will be good enough recommenders, who would be a good choice to consider? These are great questions, and that's a good one, too. Um, in terms of, of recommenders, my advice is what you really want to do is have someone recommend you who knows you well enough to complete the recommendation. In other words, if it's a professional acquaintance, someone you are working with, perhaps it's um, 
someone you did an internship with, or if you're working, uh, a colleague, if, if you're working, obviously your supervisor would be an ideal person to have you uh, ha write a letter. But bottom line, you want the recommender to be someone that knows you well enough in a professional capacity. You don't want a, you don't want a, a family member or your best friend. That, that's not going to work. But someone who knows you very well in a professional capacity who can write a recommendation letter talking about your strengths and, and what they believe will cause you to be successful at that institution. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. One more time for a, a little swig of water here and I'll be right back. Okay, the next question. Do recommenders send in their letters to the schools or do they send them to the applicant for inclusion in the application packet so that everything arrives together? Um, good question. Most of the time in these days, recommenders send their recommendations online just as applicants do. There's a, there's a URL or a website that you would be told to give to your recommenders. They would go on that website, complete the recommendation, and send it right in online. There could be some instances still where an admissions office will ask you to have the recommender give you the recommendation letter, but that's a lot less, less um, likely to happen now because of the age of online applications. Most recommenders also complete their recommendations online. Okay, uh, next question. You said it's important to get recommenders who can give specifics, but what if a recommender knows you so well that they also know your weaknesses? Ah, this is a good question. Is that okay, or is it better to choose recommenders who only, oh, am I ever glad you asked this question? That's excellent. The answer is you absolutely want your recommender to give an example of one of your weaknesses. If you come across as perfect or you look like you have nothing you know, that you're working on in your life uh, as, a, as an employee, as a person, as a student, that will hurt you. No one is perfect. So absolutely you want a recommender who knows you well enough to say, you know, now they're not, we're not asking them to air your dirty laundry or talk about your personal or private life. But what we are asking them to do is say, you know, this, this applicant has all of these three, the two or three great qualities. Here's one that I think they need to work on a little bit. That's not going to hurt you. In fact, it hurts you more if nobody ever says anything about you that is less than positive because that's not, that's not normal. Everyone has, I, I have weaknesses. I absolutely do, and my friends would be able to tell you one of them. That doesn't bother me if they do. Um, so yes, make sure your recommenders uh, can speak largely to your strengths, but also highlight a weakness. Okay, we are doing very well, and let's see what our next question would be. What would what was presented here apply equally well for academic master's programs as well as applied for professional master's programs? Absolutely. These tips uh, I, I worked in my career in a various array of graduate schools. I worked in professional schools. I also worked in uh, more uh, uh, academic graduate situations. And the tips that I've written and have presented today uh, are, are, are of use in either of those situations. And by the way, my book um, covers a lot of this in the first chapter when I talk about the research uh, that you should undertake to try to decide where you want to apply. The second chapter is all about the application process, and the third chapter is on how to succeed once you're enrolled. So uh, I hope you'll think about getting the book. Now, I promise that's the last time I'm going to promote my book to you. Okay, let's uh, go to the next question. I am an MA student applying for PhD programs. Does it look bad if one of my recommenders is not from my thesis committee? Oh no, I think it would look good if you didn't have all of your recommenders from the thesis committee. I would think you'd only need one from that group. You want to have some diversity in your recommenders. Do not choose them all from one area or one particular involvement with you. You want to have a recommender who was with you for your thesis. You might want to have a recommender who you did an internship with or who was another professor or something like that. You want to keep it varied. I, I would not encourage you to use all the same type of person for your recommenders. These are excellent questions. I hope we have time to do, how are we doing? Oh, we've got some more time. All right. Could you say more about how passive 
for active to be in terms of contacting the admissions committee. You said every week is too much, um, as it's good to ask if you have legitimate questions, but what about just checking in to make sure they received everything and are considering you? Is there ever an opportunity to do that? And can you say more about what forms or level of contact during the process is most strategic? Good question. Um, here again, I do not believe it is necessary for applicants to contact the admissions committee all the time saying, did you receive my application or did... If most committees or most institutions ha have a process in place whereby you will be notified when your application is complete. Now, if it's getting to be three or four weeks since you completed your application and you believe everything was submitted, you know that everything is in there, I don't think it's wrong or, or inappropriate to maybe one time contact the admissions committee and just say, I'm just checking in to find out if you've received everything. There, but I do not believe, I think you should only do that once. In terms of when it is best strategically to contact the admissions committee, my sense is that there's one time that's best to do that, and that is right at the time you apply. Sending that cover letter or sending a message saying, you know, I just applied, I'm so interested in your program. After that, I would not be continuing to contact them again about your interest, unless you get a word from them that you need to send something else or they have questions, obviously, then you would respond. And if you're waitlisted, uh, one of the things you can do, even if they tell you there's nothing else to do, you just have to keep waiting a little longer before they give you a final decision. There's nothing wrong at that point with sending them a message saying, look, you're my first choice or you are one of my top choices. I am so glad I'm still on the waiting list and I am sure hoping you're going to admit me. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay, let's take the next question here. And it is, is do you have anything to add for those of a slightly advanced age who are applying to grad school? Yes, I have something to add. You know what it is? Congratulations. That's absolutely wonderful. Uh, in my time, in graduate admissions, uh, I, we had candidates who ranged in age from their early 20s up through their 60s. In fact, there's a growing number of older graduate students coming onto the scene in American higher education. Um, in, in some cases, for some graduate programs, the average age could be in the, in the mid-30s to late 30s. So my advice to you as, a, as a, an applicant who has a bit more experience under your belt is utilize that to your advantage in the application process. That would be a plus for you, bringing some of that experience to bear as a graduate student. So I, I would just say congratulations. I, I, my, um, my master's degree, I didn't start going for my master's until I was in my 30s. I did not finish my PhD program until I was in my mid-40s. So uh, I say go for it. I, I think that's wonderful. Um, and by the way, on my website is my email address. If after the session today you have more questions you'd like to ask me, get my email address from the website there and send me an email. And let me know you participated in the event today. I'll be happy to dialogue further with you. Next question. Uh, if you have a medical leave of absence, should you explain it? And if yes, how specific should you be? Absolutely. I think you should explain that you had a medical leave of absence, but I think that's approximately all you need to say. You do not need to go into the specifics of what that medical leave was about or no, no. You could just say, I had a medical emergency and I had to take a leave of absence from this period of time to this period of time. And you could say, if you need verification of that from my doctor, I would be happy to provide it. But that's about all you need to say. You do not have to go into detail. Okay. These are good, excellent questions, all of them. And we have a couple more here, and we're still within our time of, of, uh, of uh, an hour here. This is good. The next question, what is an acceptable reason for a lower GPA? Um, as I said earlier, in my opinion, there are some acceptable things that you can talk about re relating to a low GPA. Um, I was uh, involved in a car accident. I had a medical situation. I lost a loved one. There was a financial crisis in my family, something along that line. Or I took a, an extra honors program. I took, I took additional tougher courses. And because of that, I, I, you know, I, I probably didn't get as high a grade as I would if I had just taken the regular course instead of taking the advanced level. 
you might say that you were involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. You chose to be involved in athletics, in student government, in, in a language club, in volunteer service, and you were kind of trying to balance all of that. Um, I think that's okay to say. What you don't want to say is, you know, I, you don't want to sound like you're feeling sorry for yourself and you just, um, life is so difficult kind of thing. You need, other than that, you need, you can explain what you think happened and even if it is, um, as I said during the presentation, I didn't do as well as I should have. I did not apply myself. But if you say that, you better be sure you're taking a graduate course to, to offset what happened at the undergraduate rate that you're now capable of doing graduate level work. Okay, um, let's see here. Which program is better, or which one is better to get admission, uh, the TOEFL or the IELTS? Um, either one. There is no distinction. There's no difference. IELTS has been out long enough now and is, is uh, required and accepted by almost all graduate programs. I do not believe either one of those is more uh, telling than the other. Either one is absolutely fine. Oh, we've had a whole bunch more questions. Okay. Can research papers and internships make an impact if my GPA is low? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's very helpful. Any, any additional information you have about research papers or internship experience, and again, I would try to have you get a recommendation from one or both of those two so that that person can comment and say, look, you know, maybe Maybe the student didn't get straight A's, but boy, oh boy, here are several things they bring to the table as an applicant that we think are outstanding. That can be very helpful. Uh, next question. I have selected four universities to apply for. All of these universities have a research area in which I'm interested. My concern is that if the faculties are doing research in the same area by the time I graduate, how will I find this out? Now, let me read this again to be sure I'm understanding this. Um, I, I think you're asking if by the time you enroll at the university that you're thinking about where some of this research um, is being done that you wanted to do, um, how can you find out about this? My suggestion is that during the application process before you apply as you're, as you're researching, send a message to the university and say, can you let me know what kind of current research you are doing, if any, in this particular area? And let them, let them tell you that. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, our time is starting to run out here. I'm going to need to bring this to a close in another minute or two. So I'm, I, I unfortunately, there were other questions here I'm not going to get to. As I said, if you want me to answer those questions, go on, the web, on my website, www.gradschoolroadmap.com. It's, it was on the slides. In fact, uh, if I, there it is. It's on the, I just put it on the slide there. Go to my website and get my email address, and please send me your questions. I promise I'll answer them. But let me answer uh, probably one more here. What do you think about the value of attending information sessions uh, that are held on the campus of the university? These typically have been uh, events that require an RSVP and that you're physically present. It's costly to travel there. For these, and I'm wondering, uh, uh, you know, what you think about that. Um, that's a very good question, and I absolutely understand that not everyone has the ability to afford uh, to to visit campuses, especially if you're an international student or even a U.S. citizen going all over the United States doing this. Um, one thing I would suggest is that you try to do a virtual campus tour for every institution you're considering. Get on the website. Take the campus tour they offer on the website. If you have the opportunity to afford to go to a campus, uh, a campus visit program, maybe select one. If your finances are tight and you can't do all of them, go to the one that's your first choice and at least make a visit. I think the fact that you do visit can serve you well as an applicant because you can highlight that in the application process. And then not only do they know you were interested, they know that you really took the time to demonstrate that by coming to campus for a visit. Okay, folks, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you ever so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to speak with you and interact with you. You asked wonderful questions. Congratulations on pursuing graduate education. It will not be something that will, uh, will, will be something you'll be disappointed about, of that I'm sure, and I wish you 
all the best in your graduate school pursuits. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Don. And I would just like to echo what Don said. Thank you all for coming. And we will be sending out this uh, link to the recording of this presentation afterwards if you want to watch it again. And uh, we just appreciate your attending. Thanks so much.